This is episode seventy-one. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world, and here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello, Architect Nation. I am your host, Enoch Sears. On this show, you're going to discover strategies, tips, and secrets for running a fun, flexible, and profitable architecture practice. So, thanks for joining us today. It is great to have you here. Now, to get access to training webinars and other insider-only resources, go over to Business of Architecture and join our insiders list. You'll also want to sign up for the early notification list for the Business of Architecture conference. This is going to be the event this year for solo and small firm architects that want to run a more flexible and profitable firm and have fun doing it. We've got a great lineup of speakers, but only those on the list will get first notice with all the deets. So head on over to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash conference and get on the list. Today's show is underwritten with generous support from BQE Software, the developers of Archie Office. So I just want to thank them for their generous support of the show. For over 10 years, Archie Office has been helping architects run firms that are more flexible, fun, and profitable. So thank you, Archie Office, for empowering business of architecture, and we're glad for all you're doing out there to help architects run a more successful business. Check it out at archieoffice.com. Today's guest is Rena M. Klein, FAIA. Rena Klein is the leading business consultant for small architecture firms. She's the author of The Architect's Guide to Small Firm Management, and she was the executive editor for the latest version of the Architect's Handbook of Professional Practice. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is your host, Enoch Bartlett-Sears. And today is the, we're going to continue our conversation with Rena M. Klein, FAIA. Uh, we had an amazing conversation last week, and Rena has the intellect of Marie Curie, and <laughs> she also is the author of several uh, of a book and editor of the Architect's Handbook of Professional Practice. She's the author of The Architect's Guide to Small Firm Management. So w- welcome back to the show. Thank you. Rena. Rena, I wanted to talk a little bit today about designing the business side of a firm because I know you started out your career as a designer and then you've made a transition into actually designing business. So talk to me a little bit about maybe just about that transition, about how you went from having your own firm to getting your interest in the business side of architecture. Okay, sure. Um, well, I, I had a firm in Seattle for about 15 years, uh, actually more like 20 before I finally um, stopped doing projects. And um, in, when I into it about 12 years or so, I began to feel like I really didn't know how to run my practice. I had how far um, into it? about 12 years or so. Um, I really, uh, I had, I had up to about five employees, but there were years there where I was paying my employees more than I was paying myself. And, um, it was, you know, very stressful and, and I just, you know, just wasn't doing so well. So I decided to go back to school um, and get a degree in in management, not not an MBA, but I, I went to Antioch University in Seattle and I went to their graduate management program. And because I was more interested, I mean, I wanted the numbers part and the business part, and I got that. But I was also interested in organizational development, you know, how how people work together and how that can happen better. And um, mm-hmm. so I, I went through this program and, and sort of felt like I was getting the keys to the kingdom, you know, finding out about... Um, how businesses really work and how people work together more effectively. And, um, and, and when I graduated, I felt like I wanted to share this knowledge with my colleagues. And, um, and I also happily might add that my business started doing better and I, you know, um, was able to stabilize it and really lower my stress and make more money and do all those good things. But I, I, I wanted, I just wanted to share this knowledge with uh, my other small firm practitioners because I noticed that there was a lot of dissatisfaction. A lot of people are having the same kind of experience I was. So I started teaching through mostly through AIA, you know, um, doing uh, presentations at national conferences and through AIA Seattle and um, writing and people seem to be interested in what I had to say. And, um, and so before long I started doing consulting and, and helping 
um, advising other firms, managing coaching and facilitating retreats and doing some strategic planning and that that kind of thing. And um, and so I, I went through this transition period of about almost 10 years of, trans, of still doing projects. And and around 2007, I guess luckily, I, I received an appointment to teach at Washington State University, and I moved over to Spokane, Washington, to do that. And so all through the recession, I had a, a job as a professor, which was nice, because if I had still been in, in Seattle practicing, I don't think I would have had much work, because my, my practice was primarily residential houses, remodels, working for middle-class clientele. Um, but as so, and just towards the end of my um, work in academia, I, I got this you know position as the executive editor of the handbook, which was a two-year contract with AIA, and and in in many ways I would call that a PhD in practice, you know, because I I just learned so much from the contributors, and um, and since then I've been pretty much doing consulting full time, and um, and I continue to write and do presentations and that kind of thing. Rina, when you talked about going back to school and getting uh, studying management, consulting, and business, you said that you got an understanding about what businesses were really like as opposed to your understanding before. <laughs> and I know that's, that's a characterization, but could you just maybe talk about what you meant by that and the biggest takeaways of how your understanding of business was different after you went through that program as opposed to before? Well, um, yeah, I mean... Like most architects, especially of my generation, you know, I had no business training in school. Um, and uh, But I've always been very entrepreneurial, and um, I always wanted to have my own firm and did um, – had a design-build firm when I first got out of school. And, um, and when I finally got licensed, knew I would start a business right away. Um, and as I – what I guess to answer your question more explicitly, um, what I learned was that you know businesses work best when it, they're a combination of um, the the social systems and and then the you know business management operational systems that uh, in in the most effective way. So if you just have um, you know uh, a business that's totally focused on efficiency, so to speak, um, you're and you kind of ignore the social side, um, it's, it's not likely that you'll succeed, at least not in a professional service business, um, that, that people, that the connection between um, satisfaction, uh, you know, job satisfaction and career contentment and actual productivity is this reinforcing relationship. And so when people are happier, they work better. And when people work better, they're happier. So, um, so I think this, that was, it was really insightful to understand that how important leadership was, especially in small firms that, you know, leaders that are generous and giving and in a good mood and, and trusting often get the best performance from their professional staff from all their staff than, um, than leaders who are controlling and um, uh, maybe um, always critical or something like that. So there's that social system. And then on the other side, the importance of understanding what creates profitability in a, in a professional service firm, which is different than making widgets or, you know, in a manufacturing or, or service retail context. Um, in professional service firms, all we have to sell is our labor on projects. So that has to pay for everything else. So there has to be this billing multiple, you know, this differentiation between what you charge and what it costs you to run your business. And, and I've no and I learned about, um, you know, performance tracking and how to how to look at budgets and then track what actually is done and look at the variables and just just all these kinds of basic um, uh, skills of of running a business that that many architects don't know anything about or really um, don't think about it too much. Although it is so similar to the design process. Um, you know, you have to do, uh, you, you, you have to program, you have to understand what you're doing, and then you have to track whether it's actually accomplished it through the design um, process. And that's 
basically the, the same in, in business. Do you have any favorite tools out there for tracking projects? Well, um, you know, I have I have various Excel spreadsheets that I I share with my clients that can track 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 projects and also track firm performance in general. Take a look at um, you know uh, projected revenue and give you a sense of when it's time to hire and or maybe the other way around as you as you look forward in relation to your expenses. And I've developed various tools like that, but there are also there's also software out there like ArchiOffice or um, um, Ajira uh, by by Axiom that that are are good tools for small firms and I often recommend. Okay. Excellent. So when you when you come in and you think about designing the business structure of a firm, what are some of the most important questions that need to be asked and answered? Um, well, you know, it's sort of like just like design. It's sort of like determining your design criteria. So you know, you would never design a building without um, thinking about its purpose, thinking about a budget, thinking about its location. Um, who it's serving, um, all those kinds of things. And basically it's the same with business. So you develop your criteria. What, what's your purpose? You know, who, who's, what are your, what are your capabilities? Um, who's your target market? Um, where do you want to be? You know, where do you want to practice, um, just in your location or, or globally? Um, uh, who do you want to work with? You know, is it, do you want to be, kind of individual, you know, in your own firm, or do you want to collaborate? Um, uh, what kinds of tools do you want to use? Um, these, these are these answering these kinds of questions, you know, give you essentially a program, and then then um, you could look at that program and develop a number of scenario plans. Well, what do we, what would it be like? And and by the way, part of the program is financial because you want to know, you know, what what kind of income do you want to earn? You know, what are you likely to have to pay employees as you hire them? Um, you know, what what kind of, you know, what size firm do you want and what does that imply in terms of of revenue needed and 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 how many projects? So, at any point in a firm's development, you could you could look at these criteria and and plan next steps. You know, it could be a business plan um, that you you set up initially as you begin. Although that I have to confess, it's very unusual. Um, or it could be a business plan that you might begin to develop after you've been in business for a while, thinking about your next steps or what you what you want to accomplish. Um, but it's basically, you know, a planning process, just like, um, just like, you know, you do for for architecture, and um, and I think when we look at it in that way, it's it's not it's not that obscure. But but most architects don't um, don't excuse me really set aside the time to think about their businesses in that way, and um, and one of the things that I, I notice when I work with firms often is that they might ask me to do some strategic planning with them about their next steps. But when I get there, I find out that they don't actually have time to do this because operationally they're not real together. Mm. So often my work has to start with operational improvements and then it frees up the time maybe of the principals or the leaders to begin to, you know, plan forward. And what are some operational improvements that might be made in, in a firm in a situation like that? Well, there's there often there's low hanging fruit and and some of it has to do with knowledge management. So say the um, the principal basically of a, a small firm under 10, let's say, um, you know, they know everything about everything in the firm, but they haven't really been able to communicate that to their staff. Um, so when they're gone, which is frequently, um, you have things like people going off in the wrong direction on projects or not being able to find the information they need or, or not be able to find that exemplary plan that was done five years ago that's so similar to what they're doing now or all these, all this, these aspects of knowledge that, that often gets, is just closely held in somebody's head. So that person becomes a bottleneck in production. So what we have to do is kind of go through a process of getting the stuff out of that person's head or getting it organized in a way 
that um, it's findable and accessible. And, and sometimes that, that's a matter of looking at um, a project startup process. So you would, at project startup, the principal might kind of download everything they know about, you know, this project or this client or this um, kind of, of thing and say, oh yeah, look at this, you know, project that I did it's in filed here, you know, or whatever. And so, so sometimes that can be short circuited by doing it at the project startup point. Um, but in a bigger picture way, often it means reorganizing the server, you know, cleaning out stuff that's a duplicates or you don't know which version of the template is the right one. And, and often that means creating a task group to do this um, and engaging the associates or the senior level people in this kind of firm development activity um, uh, to lead, you know, task groups to maybe, you know, reorganize a server or look at technology issues or other kinds of things that might be, um, or even who's doing the project managing, you know, because sometimes principals or high level people are doing way too much of that. And, and somehow that has to be transferred over as well, client contact and so forth. Hey, Architect Nation, it is great to have you listening in today. I want to remind you that this episode of Business of Architecture is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice has been powering architecture firms for over 10 years and helping them to be more productive and profitable, which empowers architects to do what you like to do and what you got in this business for in the first place. Create great architecture and spaces. Go check it out at archiOffice.com. Now back to our show. Marina, in your work with firms, what are some of the common weaknesses that you see? Uh, are there any that are just kind of pretty common to us, to smaller architecture firms in terms of a business side of things? You mentioned project management is one of them. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, this, that, that it's really important for firm leaders to transfer project managers to a project management level and engage them very, very early in on the process to meet the client so that they can, um, they can uh, you know, deal with the everyday project management issues. And that doesn't mean that the, the, the principal or the leader doesn't get to do design or, or contact with the client. It just means that they may be a member of the project manager's team instead of the other way around um, so that they're freed up to do more business development and, and the kind of things that we you know principals should do only what principals can do. So um, it's, it's uh, so that's one. Um, but I think that there are, there are others that have to do with, um, Kind of a, you know, as I mentioned before, the importance of um, employee satisfaction and kind of a, a short, a short term look at what is, um, you know, good business practice or something. So there's, I, I've run into firm owners that are are very thrifty, you might say, um, but in a kind of pound penny wise pound foolish way um you know not looking at the long-term implications of um you know what might be gained through you know spending a little because they think well when you're in business you really have to be tight with a dollar and that's what's important or you have to be tough with your employees and that's what's important it's sort of this this kind of you know almost 19th century view of what mm. what business is supposed to be because they just you know they learned it from their the person they worked for who learned it from the person they worked for and it's sort of never been updated in their minds so that that happens and but i think more commonly um there's a lack of understanding of billing um of how to how to how to construct billing rates, how to construct fee proposals, how to how to construct proposals and contracts in themselves. So when you talk to, about that side of things, the proposal and contracts, are you suggesting that a lot of times architects' fees might not be structured correctly, might be too low? Well, um, again, we're you know as we talked about it before. Um, it's a competitive environment. So you have to, you know, the market is going to determine your fee to a large extent. However, what I find is that most, many architects, many small firm architects don't know how that relates to the amount of effort they're putting into the project. So there's kind of a lack of project tracking and it's kind of like, oh, well, here's how much money we have. Let's do the job. We'll see what happens at the end. Yeah, I see what you we're know? And, and there's no kind of intermediary, oh, 
well, actually, there's a scope creep going on here and we need to go back or, oh, um, you know, we really spent too much time. We're really getting to where we're spending too much time on schematics. So maybe maybe we need to make some decisions, um, you know, these you know, just having the information about the budget in relation to the, um, you know, the amount of effort that's being put into it as it goes along can do a lot to to improve the, the final outcome, um, even if you're having to keep your fees based on, um, you know, the market uh, constrictions. Um, although I think in general, um, billing rates... Billing rate should reflect um, your overhead rate, your break-even rate, you know, your profitability, how much percent of profit you want um, to theoretically get in there. And so even if your total, even if your fixed fee is has to be based on what the market will allow, you could have, uh, you know, your hourly rate be a little bit higher. So if there is additional work, you can do it at this hourly rate. Although you have to be careful, you know, it's not too high to scare your client off, even if they think your total is okay. So you have to find the right mix there. And often um, for principals, they can be a little lower than what you might want the, the billing rate to be theoretically. And, and, but for, um, and, the, and the bottom person, you know, like your admin or admin work, that billing rate should be low and reasonable because clients often look at, you know, the highest people and the lowest people and the middle people you can probably push up a little. So that's, that's a strategy that, that some, um, some people use. Rina, you, you talked about being uh, penny wise and pound foolish sometimes. Can you give me some examples of, of that instance? Oh, that's, um, I, I, I probably, the only examples I can really give is in relation to, um, you know, my, my, you know, my interactions with these firms, you know, so sometimes I will suggest that, for example, it would be good to have a firm retreat that includes all, all the members of the firm to, um, for a number of different purposes, first of all, to, you know, use the intelligence of everybody who's there, get all of their perspectives um, to deal with whatever particular problem or even strategic um, plan that's being considered. Um, and, you know, sometimes you'll get the, the uh, you know, answer, well, it's too expensive, I can't afford it, we don't want to do that. Um, but, but, you know, and, and I, I personally feel like that's, um, short-sighted because there's so much to be gained from that kind of thing in, in terms of profitability. But more than that, it has to do with how people are paid. Um, you know that that this um, that I I guess I personally believe that that firms should look to pay their employees as much as possible, and and perhaps um, you know set up a bonus or incentive program. Um, although that's a little bit harder to do in a smaller firm, and everything's so interrelated. But but I guess what I'm saying is that it isn't only it's it's really a matter of appreciation, which can be done um, not only with money but with other kinds of things um, like uh, certain kinds of benefits and and talking to people and saying you know hey would a gym membership make your life better you know hey would um, some support in childcare make your life better um, you know what can I do as your employer to to make you be able to um, work better and enjoy you know and produce better and all these things and and you know people are resistant to that because it might mean they they might make a little less money, but actually, I think in the long run, they'll be making more. You know, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of evidence. There's been a lot of research. There's been a lot of study about the importance of um, employee, especially in professional practice, in, um, professional uh, employees, that their satisfaction and feeling acknowledged and feeling appreciated has a huge impact on the bottom line. It mm -hmm. just it's, People work better. Mm. Rena, in your, I'd like to turn the conversation a little bit to some of the uh, lessons you've learned from seeing some of these firms in action. Are there any firms out there that you've seen that are smaller firms, maybe sole practitioners, that are getting extraordinary results for the same amount of effort? 
In other words, they have learned how to manage their time so effectively that they're getting disproportionate results and achieving, you know, the, the top 10% out there and kind of what they're doing differently. Well, um, that's, that's kind of a tough question. You know, I mean, I, I have some clients who are doing very, very well, but um, I feel like it has a lot to do with um, the market that they're in and, and kind of the personality of the, of the leadership. Tell me about um, the personality and the, the market. Tell me a little bit. Of, give us some insight. Well, um, being in a, in a market that they have um, positioned themselves to be the leader in that marketplace. Um, for example, I, I have a client who um, does houses on the shore and the East Coast and in the communities that he works in. Um, he's, he's just very well known as the, the person to go to for this kind of house. And, and um, he, he just really um, uh, delivers a, a, an excellent product and, and has developed a tremendous reputation. And, and he doesn't um, overcharge, but he charges in a fair way. And he has, um, you know, a tremendous backlog of people interested. So that's, that's you know, that's someone who's, you know, leverage specializing and 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 working in a local community to to a great end and i think i think that's a good strategy so he's um, positioned himself as an expert not just as an architect but an an expert in this kind of architecture i i i would i'm maybe i wouldn't say an expert in the sense that um that you might call uh you know somebody who has a a narrow um uh and deep knowledge it's more that that he's just become the go. It's more of the reputation that he's the go-to person. If you want a beautiful house that looks like that one, um, you know, but is customized to you, go to this guy. Um, so it's just that he's he's just positioned himself for that kind of reputation in these smaller local shore communities. So he's done this excellent job of positioning. I guess is really the the answer to your question and his, and his personality is very open and friendly and, and visits, he has a home in the shore too. And he visits his clients on weekends when he's down there, you know, and he's just excellent at relationship marketing and, and, you know, getting that referral because, you know, people just like him and, and he does good work. Are there, any, um, are there any special things, Rena, that he's done to position himself? You mentioned that part of it was his positioning. Um, well, for him, I think it was just kind of working at it for a long period of time, doing the the same kinds of things, and and his emphasis on keeping up his relationships. Mm. You know, um, that uh, more than anything, I think, is really what did it for him. Um, in turn, and he's he's done really well in terms of. Uh, creating, um, you know, fairly routine processes and, you know, not, not that the design part is routine, but once, um, you know, once it's the design is, is worked out, you know, there's just so many foundations, just so many soffits, there's just so many wall sections. And he's, he's kind of got a, a really good production system to, to get these houses out there, um, and, and permitted and does them, you know, really relatively quickly, um, for custom homes. And, and I think that's another key to success, really, in small firms, and I talk about it in my book a lot, which is this notion of routinizing the routine, you know, finding, you know, identifying the routine aspects of the work and really make them routine and make those templates and forms and, fi and exemplary projects findable um, and, and making, and it's not only the, the objects, you know, the the foundations, the whatever that, that have to be routinized, but it's the, um, it's the process, you know, understanding your project startup, understanding, you know, what goes on at each step of the way. And I often, um, have my clients do an exercise of kind of doing a flow chart of the, of the work process from a project coming in to, you know, it going out the door and where and identifying the places that where more routine aspects could be applied. So I've, uh, you know, I've seen some firms that are really, really excellent at that. And they, 
they so you know they don't waste time <laughs> you know they don't they don't have redos and they don't um they get things done effectively so you have more time for design you know and more time for the the more um you know creative and innovative parts of of the work um, Rena, it's it's been a great conversation i think we're about up on the time here did you have any other any other insights that you really wanted to share with the audience today about the business side of architecture? Um, I guess the only other thing I would have to say is that that I think it's really important for um, firm leaders to develop second generation leadership. Um, that I, I see now um, a lot of firms that have been in business for, you know, 25, 30 years coming to the end of the founder's career, and they really haven't developed um, second generation leadership to, um, to make the firm to, to someone that the firm would have value to, because the, the it, um, you know, once that firm leader retires or leaves, that firm will have no value to an external person. Um, I, I mean, there are, you know, some situations where that's not true. You know, they've developed a niche market or somebody could buy it from them. But most of the time, the only person who's going to see that firm as having value is somebody who's worked with you and um, can knows your client base, knows your processes and, um, and your position and can can move into leadership. And you need 10 or 15 years to really develop that. Um, so um, so for firm leaders who are, you know, in their 40s or early 50s now, you know, don't wait. You know, think about who's going to be your successor and um, and begin to to develop that person. So then your firm will have value and, and there'll be somebody who wants to pay you to go off on your retirement because they appreciate everything you've built and as importantly you've passed on all the knowledge that you've gained so that just that doesn't retire with you and that's that's important for the the growth of our profession in general so leaving a legacy yes Rena I just wanted to tell everyone that they can find out more about you and what you do by getting your book the architects guide to small firm management that's an excellent resource for architects I'm going to mention that you also have a couple of courses on practice management that are rec video recordings. They're available at aecknowledge.com. Mm -hmm. In addition, you do seminars. Um, so just give us, uh, you know, people who want to do business with you or want to learn, uh, learn from you, where's the best place to do that? Well, I guess the best place to start is my website, um, rmkline.com, r-m-k-l-e-i-n.com, or you could search RM Klein Consulting and it will come up. Um, they, I have a lot of uh, my articles that I've written on my website um, accessible, and um, and other and links to other resources as well. So it's a way to contact me through there. So feel free. All right, thank you, Rena, for being on the show. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.